This is a full recording of BBC Clicks interview with Peter Todd at the Bitcoin Squat in London. It was first broadcast on the 20th of September 2014. This recording was made by me, Chris Ellis, on the second day of filming and was only intended for personal use at the time. Since then, the BBC have released their full edits and the broadcaster has sparked a lot of controversy on social media as we felt the great deal of complexity in the subject matter had been left out due to BBC Click's show format. After notifying the BBC and with ample public discussion on the World Crypto Network, we decided to release the audio in full so you, the community, can decide on the complex subject matter and the BBC's editorial decision making. There is a transcript in the description below and please make your voice heard in the comments. I think within Bitcoin, there's a lot of people who want to kind of brush over the fact that from the point of view of someone investigating crime, it's very easy to use Bitcoin in ways that make it very hard to go trace money. And people like to get very pedantic and say, you know, Bitcoin's pseudonymous, Bitcoin's anonymous. And, you know, I don't really think that that interesting of a debate. You know, Bitcoin is not a perfect technology, but no technology is. When you say perfect, not perfectly anonymous, then that's like... Yes, but then again, I mean, nothing is. I mean, any computer system you can imagine, you can always go screw it up and it turns out there's a drone flying by your window or something. You know, anonymity is always kind of a degree. And I think the important thing is that Bitcoin is orders of magnitude easier to use in ways that are untraceable. You know, if you're, say, someone with not that much money, of course, the reality is within the finance system, if you do a lot of money, it's very easy to go set up shell companies, you know, manipulate the system to move money around in essentially untraceable ways. The system wasn't designed, per se, for that, or maybe it was, but the fact of the matter is, you can't. And Bitcoin provides the same capability for people of more limited means, you know, which is, we know, it's like to go save the clean level of playing field. I mean, that's one thing that we're looking at with this document that's supporting me from ISIS with the dark wallet. I mean, what are your thoughts on that with ISIS using the dark wallet potentially as a tool to fund their activities? In the I'm sure at some point they would. But, you know, on the other hand, I mean, we've seen ISIS and Taliban and all these organizations use some of the tools already. You know, they, the existing financial system is designed in a way that if you have large amounts of resources, you know, you can go use it to your advantage to move money around and trace them. And I suspect, yeah, there is certainly political forces that would rather that stay, stay true. And equally, I mean, you know, it's always risk, risk and reward. You know, if ISIS goes and uses Bitcoin to go and get some funding, yeah, that's enabled. But what does Bitcoin also enable technology? You know, it's the usual thing. Yeah, we could go put cameras in every bathroom. But, you know, it's not worth it. I mean, if you knew directly about an ISIS group using the dark wallet, for example, or Bitcoin, what would you, what would you do? Would you do anything to prevent something happening in that way? You know, dark wallet software. I mean, if I were to go do something to go and encourage the software to be changed, to catch them, the fact of the matter is I would be making dark wallet less safe for everyone. You know, there's no intermediate you know you go make things less safe for the people in the same way that you know if i were manufacturer of locks would i go and say you know what let's just go and make this lock not actually work because you know we'll be able to bust in criminal stores easier well sure but now criminals can bust into other people's stores easier. you know the way the world works is you're much better off if you give everyone tools to stay secure and you accept the fact that some criminals are going to use those same tools but there's not that many criminals out there, and we've dealt with this problem for hundreds of years. But I guess some of the criminals now are it's becoming very extreme, and we're seeing much more movement towards people who can act almost in the same level as state. They can develop their own military, they can develop, you know, get weapons, and some people might say the dark will facilitate. Well, I don't think that's anything unique. I mean, you know, you go back 50 years, did there exist guerrilla movements without anything digital? Well, sure. You know, there's always been criminals of various size and organization. You know, we've dealt with this problem. We know what society's up against, and we know the harm isn't that great, whereas we know the harm of totalitarian governments is enormous. But might you say that the harm is similar, because some groups like ISIS, for example, are acting like totalitarian governments. You know, we're seeing mass murders, 
oppression of women, is that something that would be useful to find? Is that something that you would Well, again, yeah, I think this gets back to the thing of Bitcoin does not change the status quo for well-funded adversaries. They already have access to it. Bitcoin changes the status quo for not well-funded adversaries, and equally not well-funded people who want to decide it. I mean, Bitcoin is an example. You know, WikiLeaks depends on it. I certainly want WikiLeaks to exist in society. I do not want it to be possible for the U.S. government to, as they tried, to have the flow of money to those groups. I mean, that's one thing we're going to look at is the Financial Action Task Force in Paris, the European Banking Authority, and also the Department of Defense in America are all looking at ways that Bitcoin is actually kind of a terrorist object. Yeah. Something that they can be happy to do about that. I think obviously terrorists will use it. And, you know, the benefits certainly outweigh the risks. And equally, obviously, terrorists will use the internet. Obviously, terrorists use freedom of speech. And we've accepted that that is a trade-off we must make. But what do you think the Department of Defense will do? Is there anything that you see? Well, what they do is a very interesting question. I mean, I think this, you know, from my point of view, I see, yeah, my role within Bitcoin certainly needs to include doing what I can to ensure that the technology defends against government actions trying to go and shut it down. Much the same way as the tour developers, you know, defend that technology against government trying to shut it down. Currently, it's mostly being China, where they've tried to use, where they've tried to go shut down Tor to go and keep dissidents from being able to go spread information. At some point, they'll break in the US as well. And they work very hard to ensure that the technology enables that. And, you know, part of that's working on the technology itself, part of that's political landscape training. Some of, some of that involves um, both things simultaneously. The coin's no different. I mean, how important is liberty to you? Well, I mean, I think liberty is just being something we've accepted in Western style democracies for hundreds of years. You know, that's, just, that's why the system works. If you don't have liberty, even with the best intentions, governments eventually slide towards corruption and totalitarianism. And you must have liberty as an opposing force to that. You know, you may not have liberty to the extent that everyone can own their own nuclear weapon, or even yeah. everyone can own a gun is something that's very contested. But there's degree, and by having balance, especially with growth of the freedom of speech, you know, the system works better. And you know, it's interesting with Bitcoin now, right now in the US, freedom of speech in terms of political donations has come up, and the Supreme Court's have very clearly ruled that money is speech. Well, from that point of view, Bitcoin is another way of preserving your freedom of speech by ensuring that you can go and give money to the causes you support. I think what's interesting, though, about, for instance, the IT situation and liberty and the concept of Western democracy is it's actually the technology is going to be aiding very essential groups. Yes. Part of Western democracy is accepting that some part of the community may not have the same values as you. And you take the broader view of if you set up a system where you can oppress that community, you've really turned turned your back on your own values. Because part of our values is the acceptance that the rights exist. So if we came to a situation that, you know, I could get a nuclear weapon and they kind of attack America and well, something that could be funded by Bitcoin, yeah. for example, is that worth it if you could have stopped it? Well, you know, again, you got to ask, well, what's the side effect of stopping it? Again, you can always say, all right, we're going to put a camera in every bathroom to go stop that. Yeah, they probably would stop it. But what's, you know, what's the consequences? And, you know, frankly, I mean, even taking such an extreme example, you know, ISIS hypothetically having a nuclear weapon paid for by Bitcoins. The fact of the matter is, we've seen the results of nuclear weapons. And you know what? Hiroshima and Nagasaki still exist, and Japan is a thriving democracy. Like, the very worst case, we have historical precedent, and we can understand that we can survive this and we can move on. Whereas countries that haven't been able to maintain their freedom, like Russia, well, look what's happening in Russia. You know, they never really were able to transition to a proper democracy. And, you know, from Canada, there certainly are a lot of Russian immigrants in Canada. You know, that really says something. Well, <clears throat> I think, um, 
I mean, for some people watching it, they they find it kind of extraordinary that you would say that, for example, the dark wallet was so important that you'd risk your home country saving nuked or whatever. That, that that was an idea that well, was freedom of speech is the same issue. I mean, heck, like, you know, my brother, he's actually going to be in Iraq in a couple weeks. He's deploying off as part of the country's air force. And, you know, I've talked to him about all this stuff, and if anything, in some ways, he's even more extreme than my position, because, of course, he is in the military. It's not ISIS. Fuck. We're going to bomb the shit out of them. You know, what does ISIS have on us? Why are we worrying about this? I guess from, from my perspective, the woman just... Yeah. With I, I do worry because I do think any like Taliban, you know, I do fear any kind of movement that is working to oppress women or doesn't recognize us as equal. Well, you know, an interesting view on that, and I'm not really sure I agree with this view, but I think it's an interesting concept is that our military power is funded by our freedom of speech, our democracy, our economy that actually works. And you know, again, I'm. I don't quite necessarily agree with this, but even if you know you take those kind of views, well, ensuring that we still have a functioning democracy gives us the legitimate to go up against something like ISIS. And from that point of view, again, you still need the self-criticism, you still need all this freedom of speech to enable us to have that moral superiority. I mean, I guess one thing people might say watching this just in the discussion about liberty is um, you guys have, we talked about this yesterday, but you guys have such a kind of vaulted position where you have this incredibly interesting technology um, that you control, basically, and that you could... We you know, influence, we don't control it. People choose to use it. People might say, well, you could choose to step in and monitor what's happening. Right. Or what's well, the interesting thing is, I mean, it's always the cap of the bit. You know, once we write the software, we can't tell people by the way, we prefer it if you um, use it in this way that happens to go break your own privacy. You know? I mean, I always see it as once, I mean, literally, once information's out there, people know how to use it. And the question is, well, what's the next step? And the next step for me is certainly, all right, let's go make it better. Make it more secure. Yeah. Because ultimately, more secure means that the majority of people who are good guys, if you will, they're, they're, they benefit more than anyone else. And, you know, in the balance, things are better off if we have grassroots advocacy friends. How can you fund that? Well, Bitcoin's one good way. You know, keep the playing field level. Are you ever tempted to use your kind of knowledge to wage any kind of political war? Or no? Well, dark world is an attempt to wage. I mean, it's, you know, it's the constant battle of the moderate defenders of democracy is going to say, yes, we've got to go keep the system the way it is. And, you know, that's what's kind of interesting, but it's just, it's returning our environment back to the days when you could go and give someone cash. You know, we've got a lot of forces trying to completely outlaw cash. Well, what does that do? It means every single part of the economy can be monitored by governments. And we have ample evidence that that is just too much power. Um, I Well, 
then to go and let society push further down this avenue of less freedom. Mm -hmm. In the exact same way as Ford maintains the ability of people to go and talk, to spread their speech. Again, that's something we've had that's being clamped down on, and I'm not sure I'll see that maintained. And you're fine knowing that obviously people in the dark world are sure, but it might result in assassination to lots of terrorism, drug deals. Of course I am. Yeah. You know, that's just part of society. I mean, we know how much harm those people do, and we know we can look at this because we've dealt with this. What we also know is that when you allow totalitarianism to happen, as you slide, you know, forward that, society does not have good ways to deal with it. And very quickly countries that make that mistake, well, they wind up having a lot of people leave and move to Canada. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it, it's like, I, I come from Toronto where, like, easy, I think the number is like 60% of the population comes from outside Toronto. And a lot of those people that I've personally met have come from very, very repressive governments. What do those governments do? They maintain controls on movement of capital, maintain controls on movement of information. I guess that's why the IT example is so pertinent to Bitcoin, because it's one thing like Bitcoin is such an idealistic concept, and it's, you know, it's great, we're going to have liberty, we're going to have anonymity. But then for some group that's so repressive, pick up on that and say, yes, this is something that will help us. It's nothing to do with liberty. Well, you know what's interesting is what countries are banning Bitcoin? not Western democracies, it's repressive though, because they themselves get undermined by these own tools. You know, ISIS, if they allow Bitcoin usage within the territory they control, what do you know, you can get the next group of revolutionaries making use of Bitcoin to go fight against ISIS itself. You know, it gives power to people with less power. No, I don't know. It's still, it's still something that is quite jarring. I guess it's, it's something that it's, it's, it's not in any way worrying. But it, for me, it was like, oh, because now I'm considering to sit on great. Like it's not something that surely you foresaw. Oh no, I think it's very obvious. It was. I mean, same way ISIS goes and uses internet, ISIS uses probably printing press. You know, I mean, of course they use these tools. The question is. Structurally, what do these tools do? They have a tendency to go give power to people who don't already have power. You know, they're most useful, relatively speaking, to, to the people who you most want to be able to go and have power. Except in this case, not. No. In this case, relatively speaking, ISIS is better off if they do not have Bitcoin within their territory. Because in that irony, of course, they can get money from outside. But within that territory, they're going to hold on to power longer if they can control those movement of cash, if they can control the economy, if they can control people's ability to speak, if they can control the internet. Sure, they may get a little stronger temporarily, but in the long run, they will be destroyed by that own technology. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they could use it in the short term to gain several million dollars, yeah. but then eventually. Yeah, here it is, like, because of the freedom and it's little undermined. You know, I love that actually um, Twitter, I think, is a really nice example of it. What does Twitter do? They go ban ISIS. Well, hang on a second. Wouldn't I rather have terrorists going and reading about Miley Cyrus on Twitter? Like, yeah, this is a tool for them to spread their message. This is also a tool for us to spread their me our message to them. You know, by kicking them out of that system, we're removing our avenue of influencing them in the same way that we've removed their avenue of influencing us. Well, between the two, which one has a better message? A better message is Western democracy. You know, the average person, yeah, that seems like a pretty good idea. And well, what do you do with the press regime? They always want to shut that picture. It really says something. Another question would be, where did ISIS get their funding from originally? Yeah. So could we talk about that as well? But also, I, I wouldn't agree with you about, about the Bitcoin thing because uh, ISIS is a political organisation, not a fiduciary um, state. Like, in, like for countries where the base of the power lies in, in finance, 
Bitcoin is a great tool for fighting the power for a political country where it's 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 different. It's not the same. Yeah, uh, but I mean, remember, in the long run, ISIS is still gonna have. They're gonna maintain relevance. They need to go have. We will. We will. We will build. We will launder the money to pay taxes, build on sense of drug markets, and there's nothing the government can do about it. We are in the G8 squad. <laughs> which, start, which the GA main dark wallet is a key money laundering tool. We're all getting arrested. <laughs> Bitcoin is for resistance. <laughs> I think I hear the drums. <laughs> So you know, you know earlier you are, you asked them about the why the anonymity is important for speech, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The if you if you want to have free speech, you need anonymity because um, because without anonymity, it can be like you can do what you can say whatever you want. Just tell me your name and address. It's in, it's important that people are able to speak. Without fear of reprisal. If I want to give money to WikiLeaks, why do I want that showing up on my credit card statement for my employers to go and start asking questions about it? Why should, in a free society, why should they ask questions about it? Oh, well, exactly. exactly. But we do not live so, in a perfect free society. Therefore, we go and take precautions to ensure that the flaws of our society don't cause problems. One of the problems is focusing a lot on. You know, an instrument to transfer money, you know, receive money anonymously, but we're missing the wide debate of financial privacy. You go and spend, you know, buy a loaf of bread at Tesla's, you don't expect the checkout woman there to be able to look into your bank account and see how much money you're getting, you know, and where you spend it, you know. Maybe you have some embarrassing medical problem, you've got to buy stuff from you to, you know, you know, it's you know, the debate's much wider than what is It's great that terrorists are using Bitcoin. It shows that the tools we're building actually work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we're building tools for people to resist power. So if the people fighting the power is using our tools, then obviously we're doing something right. They're fighting the power, but they're also oppressing. That's. I think that's the. the well, why don't why don't you fund thing. why don't you go fund yeah, but the people ISIS that it's funded by? It's funded yes. by the USA. Right. Really, like all of they the ISIS that comes, does, yeah. it comes from. It comes from Western involvement in the Middle East. It comes from you know, taxpayers. It was, it was, uh, it was Al Taliban and Al Qaeda was funded by uh, Pakistani proxies who gave money to Arab extremists when they were fighting the Soviets. The money was also given to Assad rebel forces who were fighting against Assad, who's an ally of Iran. But actually, was was that was the origins I of mean, ISIS. But when you see like you know these people kind of getting beheaded. Do you kind of seriously think, oh, it's great that they're using dark wallets? But when you see cars are wrong... Wait, how do we know they're using dark wallets? How do we know they're using oh, yeah, dark yeah, wallets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they, 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 they were, they're, they're suggesting it. Using, yeah. They, yeah. But they are That's suggesting the idea, people. When I, say, when, I, when I see people getting beheaded, I'm thinking, well, it's great that we, we give money to Starbucks or we pay taxes that's used to actually create all of these problems. And it's like, dark wallet is really like, it's really just like a drop in the ocean. 
in the grander scheme of things, you know, the, the, if you really want to see where the corruption or where, or where any of these problems come, it doesn't come from technology that's meant to liberate people, you know, technology that we can use to freely associate mutually between us, you know. It's, yeah, ter so, terrorists use phones too. Sure. And Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And why, I, maybe maybe I think it's a bad example, but maybe like an oppressive regime, say, like China. In or fact, or in fact Bitcoin, Bitcoin is great for Iran mm -hmm. because Iranian citizens can use it to evade US sanctions. But if yeah, the government in Iran, like if you, if you turn it around mm -hmm. on the other side, and it's an, a government that's using Bitcoin to oppress people. Well, if, I found, if I found a victim of this oppression and I found a way to get them Bitcoin, would you fund it with Dark Wallet to help them resist? If, I, if you found a victim Somebody of Somebody that's being oppressed by these oppressors to take Bitcoin so they can resist on the ground that's locally. Avoid, yeah, that's, we've said that already, that Iran, yeah. it's, it's useful. It's useful for people evading sanctions. But if you have the power to see in the blockchain transactions that are going to oppressive regimes or someone, you know, there's a death count or something. Well, we, we don't have the power. You don't have the power. You know, we deliberately engineer the things so that, so that there, is, there is nobody who can have any kind of power how over how the tools are used. It's up to the individual. We want to devolve power. We want to create the society where responsibility comes back into our hands. That's the only way that, that's the only way that we're ever going to progress as a species, because if we're always going to have to be trusting central bodies that arbitrate on our behalf, we're always going to be at the mercy of some different power group, whether it's ISIS or the United States or, or whoever. You know, and, and WikiLeaks WikiLeaks, as an organisation, you know they they're very interested in Bitcoin, in in how it can be used for publishing, you know, in, in because there's this human intellectual record, and and if you look, you see certain actors putting economic work into stopping things getting into that record, or even taking things out of the record, and 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 really we've got to try and expand that record as much as possible and when it gets into the realm of economic activity you know we it's really it's really in our benefit to 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 not to try and enable all kinds of human economic activity to thrive and flourish this idea of trying to trying to manage how we how we associate or how we how we construct the the, the things that we need to live is, is really a diseased mentality that is actually retarded human progress. It's just something that may come up because I think when we looked at Ladar again with Labibit and he was asked by the government to reveal his encryption keys, it's just something that people may think that you guys are capable no, of because doing. The, different, can... the difference between me and Ladar, yeah? mm -hmm. Ladar runs a service. Yeah. L Ladar runs a service where he has the servers and he operates it and he's responsible for that. We create software which is a form of speech and you run the software on your computer so you are actually operating that piece of software. Mm -hmm. but we give the instructions or the, or the recipe for, for you to use that program and we try to engineer ways that people in a peer-to-peer -peer network can run the software independently between each other so that they can Co collaborate together to perform some function, whether it's a whether it's a, a drug market or or different tools for laundering money or 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 any or any financial thing, any financial instruments like securities, stocks, shares, options. Like for instance, being able to issue a stock is illegal unless you have these expensive licenses. So we have the crowdfunding, which is which is a way for people to gain investment into a project, but it's not, a, it's not the best way to do it. You know, actually, the, the better way to do it would be to issue a stock. But we can't do that because somebody in the financial system decided that you, know, you have to be heavily licensed and regulated to be able to have access to these financial instruments. And the only people who have access to them is the large mega corporations. You know, for, if I want to raise money for Dark Wallet or some other software project on the internet or whatever social cause I have, I'm, I'm, I'm shut out of having access to that. And now, it's very telling, yeah, that the USA now is making the bit license. And the bit license says that 
you know, if you want to run a Bitcoin organization, you're going to need to have fingerprints with the FBI, background checks. You're going to need to keep 10 years of records of all the transactions with the name and address of, of both people on both ends of that. You're going to need written approval from the New York DFF. These are some overreaching, overreaching regulations. So it's like, it's really telling, like, how much this old power structure feels threatened, that they, they feel the need to, to, um, to protect their interests, to, pr to protect how the things have always been done. You know, but now we are in this new stage where we, we have withdrawn our consent and we're saying, you know, this is how it's going to be and there is, you have no say in the matter. The, the future, all throughout history, you know, uh, there were people who had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the future. And that's how it's going to be with Bitcoin. The things are changing, and that's that. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> you know, Jane, there are now like central systems where people can issue stocks and shares and, and uh, have decentralized exchange investing and all these mm -hmm. random things. You can do it right now. Yeah. It's without jurisdiction. Mm. I think what's interesting is if people think it's, it's difficult for Bitcoin because people think, oh, it's completely transparent, you can monitor the blockchain, and then I think there's a bit of... It can yeah, I want to hear you talk, because yesterday audience, you said it was intellectually yeah. dishonest. Can you say right now, is there version one of Dark Wallet that allows full anonymity, not pseudonymity, not a, a chain of numbers, but there's full... SX. You can use SX for anonymity. You have self addresses, you can Right, but can we do that now? Should we get it up on the screen and show it? Yeah, no, because the, I haven't uh, yet seen it. Dark Vault, we just added a new feature where it has a little um, anti broom missile. <laughs> right. Because my point is, at the moment, you get pseudonymity, but only, yeah. only if you really, really careful with it. You've got to use Tor, you've got to use blockchain.info with that there email no address. Such there's thing there's as processes. Absolute. No, but you, you can no, I know, it absolutely. Well. Absolutely. But yeah, what he that, said that, yesterday that, was that it is absolute, that yeah. it's anonymity, no, no, well, not pseudonymity. You can, you can get good anonymity if you're careful, if you know how to use the tools, mm. but it's tricky. But yeah. the thing is to make it more usable right. for more people to be able to have access to these tools. Chris, you could so use a like, completely anonymous system like what Zero Cash. Uh, claims to be, right? But send money to uh, a place where you're registered with... Yeah, that's KYC. right. Yeah, as soon as you and get you in and out. That's so right. As soon as you get in and out of Bitcoin, you, you, you start to get you exposed. Have tools, you know, so you need the tools which enable anonymity if you follow best practices. Hmm. Tor is another example. If you use Tor properly, you know, you'll stay, you know, assuming there aren't some weird zero-day bugs, you will be anonymous. Mm. Even if there are weird zero day bugs, it shouldn't take a couple more steps and it's pretty unlikely for them to touch you. However, if you do something stupid with Tor, then you're going to reveal your your uh, identity and location in the story. So it's mm. not, you can't rely 100% on the tool. You, know, you have to. Yes. Equally can make the same statement. People have this notion that the existing cash system is not anonymous, or sorry, the existing banking system is not anonymous. Well, what do you know in practice? When you throw some money at the problem, you hire some lawyers, you create some shell companies, you can go create something that gives enough barriers yes. that a lot of investigations fail. That's why I think it's a function of time and energy. So really what you're doing is trying to put up barriers between the, the tethering, the, the linking between you and your actions, yeah, your identity you and your the traceability. Or how much money the investigators have to go spend to, to analyze yeah. you. The, the and both sides of it, it's easy to go get a lot of money you have to spend to have any chance of finding out who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a question of how much you pay up. So you're saying we're reducing the cost of doing what people can already do. Right. Yes. Right, right. And the key thing is the cost is not a linear function. The cost is sort of this weird thing where if I have a million bucks, I can definitely hire lawyers and I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, you know, if I'm trying to go send money with Visa or PayPal, I do not have that option. It's not you know, we're, we're changing that curve. Right. You, you still have you still have trust, like you know you hire lawyers. We have to trust them, right? You have to trust the system doesn't yes. drag the information out. But of then I go hire a lawyer to go hire a lawyer. Every step increases the probability of me getting away with it. Well, we make that step number one doesn't cost that much money and makes it easy to go to get away with it. And it tends to do a better job of that for small amounts of money anyway. So we're getting practical. There are practical problems with moving. Hundred million dollars with Bitcoin, you know. There's in the same way that there are not practical problems with moving hundred million dollars with fiat, mm. staying anonymous, mm. you know, kind of inverts this relationship that we currently have. Mm. 
with Jared Paul, you'd be able to move hundreds of millions of Bitcoin dollars. But how would you necessarily use it? Yeah. yeah. Like, if, if you have, you know, when I gave you a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you wanted to actually use that. First of all, there isn't a, a large Bitcoin economy to spend directly with Bitcoin. That's the thing. So you'd have to convert that to fiat, mm-hmm. and good luck with that. Yeah. You know? exactly. I mean, just for the the silk, um, for the FBI to, you know, they stole all these bitcoins from the Silk Road and sold them, you know, on the open market. That thirty thousand bitcoin, you know, was it, it caused the markets to crash. Just mm-hmm. the concept that there were going to be these extra thirty thousand bitcoins, you know, there is just isn't the liquidity. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin is a tiny drop in the ocean. Most most um, multinational companies, you know, not I mean, have a larger uh, kind of market cap than Bitcoin itself. And really, again, seven billion or something. Now, mm-hmm. Let's assume Bitcoin becomes to the point where you can go move hundred million dollars to the country and I. Mm-hmm. Well, then we're back to where we all are already, already are, which yeah. is a known problem. Yeah. Yeah. We can deal with it. It's no big deal. Yeah. You know, we can live with that. Mm-hmm. And we have solid evidence that we can. And what's great about all of this is that we're talking about it, and Bitcoin made us talk about it, and Dark Wallet is now making us talk about it again. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. What we're really talking about is whether is whether cash is is legal anymore. I mean, is it, is it legal to transact in cash? Because I mean, how, much, it how much money do you actually spend on a given week in actual paper and coin? Very little compared to all your electronic mm-hmm. transactions. Mm-hmm. We have a digital you know, currency right now, mm-hmm. which is completely not anonymous. Right? Mm-hmm. Where we used to have a cash, you know, we, we, people move gold around, right? It was completely anonymous so they, if they wanted it to be. And that was perfectly legal. Mm-hmm. It still is perfectly legal. But the question is, from a practical standpoint, are we, are we willing to give up what, we, what was perfectly legal? To transact anonymously in cash, which we did 100% of the time at one point, mm. which we do maybe 5% of the time and now. Again, it's very about to have none. If you had if you had a lot of money, could you go and evade all this stuff? Sure. I mean, look at the fine arts market. It's mm. a really yeah, yeah, an yeah. enormous fine arts market. Do right. people really care what art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, they don't. No, they're trying to go move money. Did <laughs> <laughs> you look at how um, capital controls are evaded in China? I think mm-hmm. there's a limit of uh, fifty thousand US dollars that you can shift out of the country, and you know there there are these stamps, you know, some kind of like you know postage stamps, which are worth some inordinate amount of money, which they people trade, you know, as mm-hmm. a way because they can you know they can trade them in China, take them out of China, and sell them, you know, and convert them into cash. Well, even so, even this building. Like it's a tax evasion. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. building is a tax evasion itself. Yeah, it's a registered by a charity. It's mm. a fake charity. Mm. You know, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting because I mean, as Amir says, this is leveling the play, playing field. Mm. When you look at the corruption that's going on, you know, and the, the wrongdoing that's going on. I mean, the HSBC you know, yeah. has got away with funding, you know, uh, criminal gangs and, and mm. drug lords. Which have been responsible? Is it like sixty thousand deaths or something in, in Mexico? It just feels like a shame, I guess, that Bitcoin is going to be painted with the same brush that. No, I think it's alright. No, 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 it's alright. I can look at it. Reappropriate the word. Yeah, exactly. Money, right? Reappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jen, the. Um, Embrace. When when the conversations were starting about Bitcoin in the beginning, mm-hmm. you know, it was all Silk Road drugs, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this year. You know, there hasn't been much of that at all. It's all been about big finance and, you know, mm. because big business is getting involved, PayPal is getting into it, yeah. eBay is getting into it, you know. And it just now, feels like it's becoming just the same as everything. Well, exactly. Like but now, now there's this sort of ISIS thing come out of apparently nowhere, although we forget it's our governments who actually have been funding them in Syria. And it's just now they're not yeah. something we like yeah. because they've spilled And it was our money that they used, it was taxpayers' yeah. money. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you who's, who's the rebels, yeah? When they're, when they're in Syria, they're the good guys. Right. When they're in Iraq, they're the bad guys. That's, right. That's exactly it. <laughs> There's a picture that's been tweeted around still to this day of uh, um, started a month ago of, um, God, who is it? John McCain. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. And Clinton. Oh, yeah. And Hillary Clinton. And now Abu Mosa, yeah, yeah. He's been dating Harris with one of the heads of ISIS. Right? You, you know, you know Vice did it. that documentary, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know they've got all the like PR videos with that guy. Abu Moza. Yes, right. There's like video. There's like pictures of him with like chummy. being all chummy with John McCain. Because because when in Syria, then these guys are the good guys because they they give them uh, weapons and they can fight. You know. Um, the enemy of. The enemy of the United States. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When when those people they go into because the problem is what America is doing is funding an organization who has its own ideology. It's not as a part of you know the United States Army, right? Yeah. So the problem is that in in 
funding those people, then they get you know like more empowered to do to follow their own ideals, which you know had a thing like invading other countries like Iraq. Meanwhile, what was the soft road did? Well, he went to a lot of uh, nonviolent neckbeards sitting in their basement for sold drugs. <laughs> I'm not exactly that concerned about that. And it took the violence out of the transaction. Yeah, yeah. in fact, yeah. in fact, not only that, because also it gave access to not, a lot of drugs to a lot of people. Selling, right? Well, different psychedelics. The difference between going, you know, buying drugs physically, you know, it's very dangerous. You can be robbed, etc., etc. Yeah. Um, also, the quality, you know, there's no way to sort of, you know, if you're selling me cut, something that's cut, you know, I can't really come back and complain because you're a drug dealer and you've got lots of guns, right, mm-hmm. or friends with guns, but. On the Silk Road, you have this reputation system. Mm. You know? So people have to deliver, and they have to deliver quality. Mm. It's kind of ironic, you know. Yeah. And, and that ends up being safer because at least people, when they, you know, are buying whatever drug it is, are getting the drug they buy. Mm. Which is benign, but then you have things like child pornography as the. Well, I think, I think, uh, oh, like Jimmy's tablet. Jimmy's tablet. Yeah. And then the people of the BBC. Sorry. Child pornography and Bitcoin. Wasn't that the primary novel you know yourself? The irony. Yeah, they used to have a good novel. They used to have a good novel. The children had a social service. It's a good novel. Yeah. It's a problem. But, you know, what's fascinating about this stuff is, well, all right, when when is money involved? Yeah. Well, money ends up being involved when there's just people who, for economic reasons, are in in a bad situation. I mean, especially like, you know, I have a friend of mine who's a pediatric psychiatric nurse. You know, she spends a lot of time, especially with troubled teenagers. Well, when do they get involved with prostitution? Well, when they don't have a place to stay. Mm. When do they get involved, you know, letting people take photos of them? When, when they don't, you know, have a family to go back to. And you stop this stuff? Well, you could go spend a ton of money trying to enforce one side of it. Or as it turns out, it's actually really cheap to, like, maybe send some money group home and actually fund the problem. You know, we have very effective ways of fighting this stuff. But, but and equally, we've dealt with the problem for a very long time, and we know it does not spread in the bedrock of society. It's very unfortunate. But Peter, do you remember with the earlier commercial internet days, the only thing people talked about was that the internet was, you know, down for Yeah. That was it. Yeah. The only thing people wanted to talk yeah. about, right? We're going to yeah. regulate this, that, and the other thing about the internet. We don't talk about that anymore, yeah. right? It's this, it's, this, it's this amazing technological, you know, innovation that not, not changed the world. Not only really that, right? I mean, you've got mainstream programs, the TV is filling the, you know, the latest internet app. It's considered such an important thing to society. We yeah. now have uh, governments allocating billions of dollars in cyber defense. Yeah. You know? right. I mean, it's, but, but the only yeah. thing people talked about in the early commercial days of the internet were the pornographers and the criminals and the money lines. Yeah. I think just like we've seen big on that it's undeniable, yeah. The Silk Road gave people a lot of drugs, yep. and uh, it's like giving people more access to more and more drugs. And I think it's really interesting because, as a model of how a marketplace could work, if the people were anonymous and all the different tools used for people to be able to find buyers, to be able to transact with people over the internet, that give an image for how we can build. Um, not only sh- online shops, but various forms of marketplaces for all different kinds of purposes. You know, like, because I, I work with the cooperative in, in Europe and all the different tools that we can use to empower local producers and, and bring back the trade to group because, like, our consumption is separated from the production and there's all these hidden costs. You know, things like the soil being degraded or the, or the health, you know, like all the chemicals that are put into our food. But when the things are more locally connected, you know, there's more, it's, it, it enables, uh, the, not, only does, not only are we getting products that are, are, are better and we can see the real cost of our consumption, but also it's like the money goes back into your local area. It goes into your friends as opposed to flowing to the monolith. To the to the top of the triangle. You know, a really interesting point about Silk Road. Everyone focuses on the fact you can buy drugs uh, there and, and other stuff, but they forget people were selling Bibles on the Silk Road too. Because is it could in Korea? I've, oh, right. They're not allowed to, to the buy. Some, somewhere they're not allowed to buy Bibles, right? Mm-hmm. 
and that was a huge market. It wasn't even niche, it was huge. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, tour is another thing that, that um, is attacked a lot, but you forget it's the government that actually, you know, yeah. the US government made sure, this. Yeah. You know, exactly, exactly. And they're still funding it. Well, so you, also, you, you know. say about the child porn as well, <laughs> and the, thing to, the thing is, is that, um, is that these things, like if you go, if you see like 4chan, where it's everyone's yeah. anonymous and uncensored, and you see Nazis and anarchists and, and child porn and all different kinds of stuff, this is a reflection of the society that is, you know, so this, right. like it, maybe you, you know, can stop or like, cover up. Really child porn, digital cameras. Why aren't we regulating digital cameras? Mm. Well, obviously we don't do this because the benefits outweigh the risks. Mm. It's just such an obvious thing. It's such an obvious thing. Same for video cameras. Yeah. Mm. You know? People and I'll bet you, find you could probably go find some people arguing back in the early days video cameras. Yeah, we could regulate this because this, this, and that. Of course, fortunately, we rejected that. And now that we've you know, dealt with the problem for 20 years, eh, actually, you know what? It didn't turn that bad. Society moved on. It was a very but, but if you censor child porn, you're not going to stop child abuse. Yeah. That's the point. You know, the, the most the most telling thing actually uh, for me was during the uh, Senate hearings last year. Um, you know, the head of FinCEN stood up and testified that they didn't need any new laws to regulate Bitcoin <laughs> to, to, to deal with uh, criminals, you know, drug dealers, terrorists, you know, you name it. They didn't need any more laws because uh, they had sufficient tools already to find and prosecute prosecute criminals who use Bitcoin. You know, so therefore. We can tell that it maybe isn't such a problem. It's a, just a different way of transferring money, but maybe they've got enough, you know, investigative and regulative power. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the system doesn't work when you try to drive things to zero anyway. You just have to accept that, you know, you're going to end up with some some kind of wrongdoing happening, and life, you know, life goes on. Total information freedom. Yeah. <laughs> No compromise. No You accept the bad with the good. Yeah. Um, you, know, I, I would, you, you and I would differ on this like, question of uh, utility versus you know natural rights. Because you said like it's a cost benefits thing, right? Why do we why do we let people have cell phones? Because there's yeah. benefits. And I would say no, absolutely not. We let people have cell phones because we don't have the power to take away their right to do whatever they want to do as long as they don't hurt somebody else, right? Mm-hmm. So th- fundamentally, the question is: Do you want to live in a free society? Right. Do you want free speech, or do you want to make everybody say the right things? Right. When the fax machine came about, then you know, that was enough. People would be uh, prosecuted for mail fraud, you know, for sending a fax, because you know there was a monopoly on. I mean, it's just every time a new technology comes, there's this sort of pushback. And the moral panic every time a new technology comes. Yeah. People say, "Oh no, this is going to you know cause all these terrible things, and cause all these terrible things." There was, not, there was a, the case. It, it was punishable by again. death. Right, to use the prison press. That's how far it went. In the beginning it was like, you know, they, they, they regulated it, you know, and had more and more stiff and stiff lines until it was punishable by death. Pretty much that's great. Yeah, yeah, I remember re- there's like this law that he was like say he was saying, oh the cop because people used to go and get their news from the pulpit, he was saying like, oh the common man would be able to like read books that be no, no, terrible no, read the Bible. like that was the issue. Yeah, 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 the Bible as well. Yeah. You can't just tell them this is yeah. what God you can't tell them this. It says yeah. you're going to go check this, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm going to go check this. That's why. <laughs> you, you can't tell them indulgences are in the Bible anymore when they read it and they find out that they're not, right? That's the that was the issue. Yeah. Yeah. uranium was everywhere. It yeah. was really easy to go dig it out of the yeah. ground. Of course, given you know the cost benefit, I can just pretty quickly go figure out the cost of having just giving people access to technology. They want to build nuclear weapons with a couple of schools. And we probably would have to say, yeah, unfortunately for this, we have to just create a whole lot. You know, and all this stuff, it's just this thing that we already have. You know, we know the cost of that. We know we can live with it. <laughs> We pay our license fee too. Yeah, well.
Yeah. Throw me off that. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a, that, that British thing right there. Like the, <laughs> the, the British TV, thing. TV, <laughs> the TV cops that, like, make sure you're not watching without a light. Yeah, we used to, like, we used to, like, <laughs> close hilarious. the windows right? and see the door, like, when they came Yeah, they could, like, drive around with a Snoopy van and try to... Yeah, yeah, they would, like, knock our doors and just, like, ignore the... I was reading about that just a little while ago. Yeah, it's from my childhood. Yeah, it's fine. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they like to take TV from the television and switch off to TV. But doesn't that pay the BBC budget? Yeah. No, BBC World Wide can afford the television. No, they're a big part of their budget. No, I'm not. Yeah, it's a television tax. It's Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson. No, no, no. Do you know how much money that man has made up of? Just like to think of this to other countries. Is it the BBC that plays, uh, what, what's that guy with the long hair? He's like, oh, I'm a revolutionary. Oh, him, yeah. Who's that? Russell yeah, Brown. Russell Brown. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's got his own YouTube channel now, yeah. where he makes which, fun which of that. Which channel was funny? Is it Channel 4? Well, well he, was on, he, was, he was on Radio 2, he, he was on Radio 2 and he got fired back then. That was a while ago. That was a while ago. Is that the last time that you watched any BBC? No, 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 I haven't, I haven't watched TV for years since yeah. I was like a teenager. Yeah. I, just, I have the internet, it's way better. You can yeah. download all the movies, all the music, all the YouTube. Yeah. It's like TV just like wastes a lot of time. Yeah. Like you get a lot, a lot more shit done. Like, don't have one. Oh, but only that it's being used as a weapon against people. Like the high flicker rates, the, the programming, the bad programming from the BBC. Like you can't deny it's being used as a weapon against every single. It's like a firmware. It's like a human firmware upgrade. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're basically right. downloading your firmware when you're watching. Oh, right. and now we're, and now we're going to use. Yeah, no, we're just against yeah. the yeah. 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 I watch hard talk by Chris. I pay for my show on YouTube by Chris by Chris Stuff.